I think I got 20 minutes to give this talk once. Had the same number of slides about. It was not a good idea, to be honest. It's a very bad idea. All right, I don't want to wait anymore. So, uh, yeah, let's get started. So, um, so yeah, this is a Stronger Than Fear Mental Health and Development Community. If you are going for some other talk that you want to be in and it's not this talk, please leave. Um, so this is the first time I've been to a Drupal conference of any kind whatsoever, which is, I guess, a cool thing. So you might be wondering, like, who is this person that you're talking to or is talking to you? You're not talking. I'm talking. Um, I've been a web dev for about 20 years. I have done a bunch of different stuff, mostly PHP and JavaScript, uh, some Python, some DevOps, some, a lot of design work when I was younger before my skills were exceeded by the requirements of the internet, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I've been a team lead, I've been a lone wolf, I've been a CTO, I've done a lot of different stuff. And I'm a dad, and I'm a husband, local community participant, I've served on school boards, I've done all sorts of crazy stuff like that. School board was probably the hardest job I've ever had. That actually kind of sucked. Uh, I have been known as a webmaster. Who here has been called a webmaster at some time in their life? All right, you're all very old. <laughs> all very, very old. Uh, I worked at a university, so they continued to call me webmaster up until 2010, which was crazy. Uh, some irony in my use of that language. Sorry about that. Uh, so I've been doing something called open sourcing mental illness since 2012. And what is that? Basically, I've been talking openly about mental health stuff and the mental illnesses I deal with and how this affects me and how it affects us in the tech industry since 2012. I'm also, I'm the founder and I'm the chairman of the board of Open Sourcing Mental Illness, a nonprofit uh, 501c3 organization that was formed in 2016 sort of around these efforts. Uh, now, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a psychologist, uh, I am not a mental health professional. Uh, I am certified in mental health first aid. It's a one-day course that I took, but I'm not a pro. I probably am about as, you know, like how, you know, just because I use the toilet doesn't mean I'm a plumber. Uh, I am not qualified to diagnose you in any way. Um, but I'm here to talk about what it's like to have a mental illness from my perspective, to talk about that, but then also to talk about how mental health affects our community and our industry and what, the kind of, what are some things that we can do about that. So... This is the uncomfortable audience participation section. I changed the colors in my slide, so I want to make sure it looks okay, like it's seeable. So I have a, a couple different questions. I, the, the microphone doesn't move with me, so I can't dance around like I'm used to on the stage. Um, so I'm curious, how many of you wear glasses or have some sort of ocular cl or crutch that you use to uh, see a little bit better? Uh, most of us here looks like we do. And that is something that happens because human beings maybe weren't supposed to live this long and eventually their bodies give out. And their eyes give out sooner than the rest of the stuff. So uh, we have to wear glasses to sort of get by in society, uh, to do things like drive or get around and not get hit by cars when we're crossing the street and things of that nature. Um, so that is a pretty typical, a very common, but in some sense, disability that we have. Uh, that, so every, and many people have to do this. We have to wear glasses openly or we wear contacts. Nobody's afraid to talk about it. How many of you are afraid to talk about that you wear glasses or contacts? Don't like to talk about it. Makes you uncomfortable. Maybe somebody will think I'm weird. Does anybody do that? All right, well, good. Has anyone ever asked you to try harder instead of wearing glasses? Anybody? All right, I guess there's a guy there trying without glasses. I was not suggesting that, sir. All right, don't, don't make me the cause of your problem. Um, all right, okay, so we're fine with this. Glasses, you know, everybody, lots of people do it, like 75%, 80%, I'm sure it's something like that. Okay, so another condition that's pretty common is diabetes. And I, my three people in my family, and I have eight siblings, two parents, eight siblings, so big family. At least three off the top of my head have developed type 2 diabetes. Maybe more. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. 
Um, so I'm kind of screwed genetically in that respect. But I'm curious, how many here uh, would feel, let's say in your workplace, imagine the people that you work with or that kind of thing. Or if you're a student, you know, people you see regularly in your, uh, those kind of social groups. Uh, would you feel okay talking about diabetes if it's a subject came up? I'd like you to raise your hand if you'd be okay with that, like it wouldn't make you deeply uncomfortable. Raise your hand if, you, if, it, if you're kind of cool with that. Okay, all right. Now for some people it's not. That's okay, there's nothing wrong with that. But we speak pretty openly about diabetes. We pre speak pretty openly about how to get treatment, what you should do to try to prevent it, and things like that in our society. And it is something that if it's not treated, it kills people. They die sooner or they, they suffer for a long time if they don't get treatment for it. And this is a typical thing. That if we don't, don't sort of work on that, that's a problem. So we speak pretty openly about it. Speak pretty openly about it. Now another condition or a group of conditions would be cancer. And, and, and I, I lost my brother to cancer. Uh, I'm sure many of us have either lost loved ones, family, friends, or deal, have, have experienced it ourselves have, have fought cancer. It's really common. It's really disturbingly common. And it's touched most of our lives. But we also have entire months dedicated to kinds of cancer, things of that nature. You know, professional sports sort of do awareness things about it. I'm curious. I'm going to ask that same question. You know, you're in that workplace environment that you were thinking about before. How many of you would be okay if the topic of cancer comes up? You'd feel okay, comfortable, yeah, maybe not excited. Not like, hey, so how was your weekend? Cancer. <laughs> you might not do that. But, you know, it wouldn't be like the worst thing possible. Now, for some people, it brings up really bad stuff, hard things. I mean, it certainly has hard associations for me, thinking about my brother. And that's hard. That's really hard. But we also speak pretty openly about that. We speak pretty openly about it. It hasn't always been that way. Four years ago, 50 years ago, we didn't do that about cancer. And as a consequence, lots of people didn't get treatment, didn't get care, that kind of thing. Now, I've talked about a number of what the things that we consider just primarily physical issues. You know, things like you, know, you have to wear glasses, or you have diabetes, or you have cancer. But what about mental illness? This category of, of different conditions that are described in, in books, and we have diagnoses for, and they're categorized, and things like that. How many of you would feel okay talking about mental illness in that same workplace group? How many? So a lot less. Like, I think safely less than half of the group in here. Not many people do. Not many people do. And I think that's pretty interesting. And I think that's interesting, particularly in the light of some of the stuff that I'm going to show, with, show and share with you, to, to th keep that in mind. Keep that in mind uh, when we think about these sort of major health issues and, and ha our openness about it and how that affects our ability to treat people. But back to me, my most interesting topic. Uh, I have two things. I have generalized anxiety disorder. That is the first diagnosis I have. So if you go through this whole medical system, they got to give you a diagnosis so that you can get treatment. So you have da, da, da. so there's like all these criteria. There's certain criteria you have to get. So I have two diagnoses officially. I have things. I have generalized anxiety disorder and I have ADHD. So generalized anxiety disorder for me, uh, it kind of works like this. I basically have fight or flight reactions when it's not appropriate. So it doesn't mean that like I'm having reactions that are ab that are unnatural necessarily. These are things that happen to everybody for the most part. But they happen in usually existential threat kind of situations. Your brain is designed to detect threats and protect itself, okay? That's why you have an anxiety response to things. You have a stress response. You have a, you go into a state of you know, your heart rate goes up, your body gets pumped full, of, it starts generating chemicals like adrenaline and cortisol and fills your body with that stuff because it allows you to do things that you wouldn't do normally if you were just super mellow. And being super mellow is pretty cool most of the time, and we all love to be super mellow. But we don't want to be super mellow if like a lion's about to eat us. 
that is not the time to be super mellow. I'm going to have to roundhouse kick this lion, or I'm going to have to run super fast, and really neither of those things are going to happen. Um, but if I'm in that existential situation, you can imagine, this is a terrifying state. I might die. That is terrifying. That is a, and that is an appropriate time, an appropriate time to have that kind of response. I should be afraid. I should be scared. My heart rate should go up. I should get a, have adrenaline. I should have cortisol in my body. I should, that, all those things should happen so that I can run faster and I, am, I, I can react faster and do all of those things. It is not appropriate to have that kind of reaction when you're standing outside a bar that you've never been in and you know your friends are waiting inside for you, but you've never been in there, so you don't really know the rules and you don't really know the layout and you don't really know the other people that are in there and you're just kind of trusting that your friends are in there and that really, really freaks you out. And you get really scared. You have that kind of reaction in a situation where it's not appropriate. You're not doing it on purpose. This is not particularly fun for me to do. Not, there's nothing enjoyable about it, right? You know, it doesn't make my life better. It makes my life much harder. Uh, but it does. I have those reactions for, you know, various reasons. That's the, the complex thing of the psychology and the physiology of it are complex. But the fact is that I have those reactions at inappropriate times. It's not appropriate to have those things because I'm afraid to use the bus because I don't understand how buses work from a monetary and payment standpoint. I don't get it. Am I supposed to bring a 20? Do I tip the driver? I don't know these things. And you think, you know, yeah, it's kind of goofy. It doesn't, it doesn't add up if you think about it. It doesn't add up. You're like, what, well, what's actually going to happen? Like, what is, what? But the problem is that, the, you know, some people find that they develop, they view as threats things that aren't actually, say, existential threats, but are things like embarrassment. And I particularly, one of the things I have problems with is that I get really embarrassed if I don't understand etiquette or rules of a situation, and I get very uncomfortable. My brain starts telling me something's wrong and something bad's going to happen. And I can't necessarily put my finger on it, but it, it's, it feels that way. It feels that way. So for GAD, however you want to call it, generalized anxiety disorder, that's kind of what it's like for me. Now, ADHD, and, you know, I, I describe these things as separate conditions. They are all just the way my brain works, and they're one thing. It just happens to be that they fit into these two different categories that are parts of the medical system, so that how we get treatment in this country. So ADHD, or uh, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, uh, I was diagnosed with it at 27. I absolutely have had it my whole life. It is, didn't, like, magically develop when I was an adult. Um, it, uh, it, I had it my whole life, all through school, all through... Uh, uh, you know, elementary school through college, I had it. And I somehow got through it, but without any treatment or without any understanding of coping skills or anything like that. But what goes along with ADHD for me, and there's, there's, there's some variety. There's, a, there's sort of like a couple different categorizations. They put sort of subcategories of ADHD. But the things that, there's some things that you commonly expect. You think of people having trouble focusing and sort of jumping from one task to another and things like that and not being able to stick on one thing, doing lots of little things, right? And that is, and never sort of like focusing on the task they actually have to do, the thing that is, would be appropriate for them to complete at that time. They are avoidant of that. Avoidance is a big thing that people with ADHD do. So I have a lot of trouble focusing on avoidance of less appealing tasks. Like, when, it, when it's been untreated, it is a lot more exciting for me. This tells you, okay, I'm going to date around when I started getting, you know, treatment for it. It was a lot more appealing to read stories on Slashdot <laughs> than, to, uh, than to, like, do my work, okay? So I, and I also ended up gravitating to jobs that were sort of lower pressure because I could kind of get away with that. It was easier for me, and I, you know, I find, found myself going in those places. But I would like, I would go a week or something like that with basically accomplishing nothing because I just, it was like every day, I just couldn't freaking focus. And it was just, I would just do, I would just read little, the internet is fabulous in terms of like rewarding you for reading little bits of information and giving you dopamine, your brain rewarding you with dopamine every time you read a little, some stupid bit of information. It's awesome at that, right? That's like what, you know, Wikipedia, like going down a rabbit hole, Wikipedia rabbit hole. Well, it's all like your brain just, if your brain likes to get little piece of information like that, 
it just, the internet is like a perfect reward system that accomplishes nothing. Um, but there's a couple things that go along with it that I think sometimes people don't realize that are pretty common with ADHD. Um, I have a really low frustration threshold. So that means that I can, and going along with that, my emotions tend to come on quick and they come on really intensely. Particularly negative emotions, but sometimes positive ones too. So I get upset or excited faster than most people. Um, I particularly find myself that like things that will eh, kind of annoy some people will really upset me. And this is a constant struggle that I have, all the relationships in my life and things like that. That's something I have to watch because it, it'll be like, why are you getting so upset about this? And I, I don't know. It's just what my brain is doing. My brain is like it's, it's, an alarm starts going off and it starts screaming at me. It, 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 ah. The emotions are so intense that sometimes I feel really out of control and I have to go and sort of segregate myself off into another room to just be away from people because I'm afraid of what I'm going to do because I'm afraid of like saying terrible things or saying mean things to people because I feel my emotions are so out of control they put me in a place where I feel like I want to yell or say mean things or stuff like that. And that's a really common, unfortunately, common thing for me. There's people looking at the room. They can, Come on in. It's awesome in here. Super exciting. What's the deal with the echidna thing? Is this a company? Do you play hockey? I'll allow it. Okay. All right. And one interesting thing is there's a lot of what they call comorbidity. It sounds horrible. It sounds like you're going to get killed to death twice. Um, <laughs> it just means you have two things. That's all it means. If you have a cold and a sore throat, you have comorbidity. <laughs> um, so... It is really common that people, with, or pretty common, like at least last I saw a number, 35, 40% of people with ADHD also have an anxiety disorder. This is not surprising because there's a lot of things about these things that seem to go hand in hand. It's really just about the way a person's brain works, and it happens to be it falls into these two different sort of categorizations. Um, but I'm really, really good at constructing bad outcomes because I'm good at creating things in my head that I'm emotional about or have an emotional attachment to, a strong emotional connection to, and then really hyper-focusing on them. You know, that hyper-focus stuff where stuff that I'm emotionally involved with is like the only thing I can do. That's part of it. That's what ADHD is like. And sometimes it's positive. It's like I'm really excited about doing something. And then sometimes when it's something I'm fucking terrified about, that's the only thing I can think about. And I am awesome at coming up with the worst possible situation and then assuming that that will be true and living my life as if that is an inevitable outcome even though it's probably pretty unlikely. And then when things happen that seem to, that in any way might confirm my suspicions, it's very hard for me to slip away from that and say, no, that's just life. Sometimes bad stuff happens. And it does not mean that everybody's out to get you <laughs> or that every, there's going to be a disaster at any given point in your life. Or that, you know, anytime somebody doesn't return their email, you return your email quickly or respond on text messages, it doesn't mean that they hate you. Right, but sometimes I think that. So I take meds every day. I have to take pills. I take kind of a lot of pills. I don't really like taking a lot of pills, but it's what I got to do, or otherwise things are going to be a lot worse. That's just kind of the way it is. I have these chronic conditions, and I have not successfully been able to figure out, say, the psychological aspects or other kinds of things that are that are causing it. So I also take medication, but I see a therapist too about every two weeks. More recently, because my life has been a little bit of a shit show, uh, it's been more like every one week. And I talk about, though, I talk with her about how and why I do the things I do, what's going on in my life, things like that. But really, again, how and why I do the things that I do. And we come up with strategies to try to address them. So for, for different people, talking therapy, not in, as opposed to drug therapy, talking therapy can be a lot of different things for different people. But at the end of the day, for me, I view my therapist more as a life coach who actually knows what she's talking about, who is trained. Somebody's laughing. <laughs> yeah, there you go, life coach. Um, it's kind of like a mentor uh, who actually knows what's going on uh, with stuff. I keep saying that. I meant that not in a negative way. 
Uh, we have you know, traditions of mentorship, like in the, I believe you do in the Drupal community and, and in other programming communities and stuff like that. Somebody who has experience with this, has training in this, has, you know, understands these kinds of things, works with people to help them do a better job of at X. And what she does is to help me figure out my behaviors, how to break them down, and how to modify them so that I don't keep doing those same behaviors that I find un, you know, hurtful or destructive or unpleasant to myself and to others. So it impacts my work every single day. Every single day I am dealing with these things. Every day. There's not a day that goes by that I do not have, I, I am not conscious of the fact that this is the way my brain works. And sometimes it absolutely like gives me superpowers. It gives me an ability to do certain, particularly certain aspects of my job I am good at because of the way my brain works. I'm absolutely, and I'm better at it than some people because of that. There have been things that I've found that I'm able to make connections kind of faster than some people do. I'm really good at free association, and what that means oftentimes is that I'm good at, like, you know, most web applications now have complex stacks from, like, dev, like from like DevOps and things like this, all like, and then firewalls and junk like that, load balancers and stuff, all the way up to, like, the user interface and the design work and stuff like that. And I have an ability to kind of see like, okay, if we do this on the, like in this system down here, like down at the bottom where you can't actually see my hand, let's see it like this. Hey, there we go. Here's the DevOps down here. And here's the exciting design and UI work down here that I probably wrote in React for some reason because it, I need to write something that compiles into some other language for the sake of, I, I'm, I'm just mad and I'm old. Um, <laughs> And so, but I'm pretty good at this, like, okay, if we make this decision down here, that, that means we're going to have to change something up here, like the way that people interact with stuff. That's going to affect, like, how, how we have to handle input, how we have to handle output. I'm good at anticipating a lot of security issues. Most web application security issues are simple stuff. It's all about, like, the stuff that's coming in, and could you send something that you don't want? Are you sure you know what's coming into the system? And are you sure you're not going to accidentally spit out something that's dangerous? That's most security issues in web applications. And so I'm, I just, after a while, I sort of figured out that I didn't understand why other people didn't see certain things that when I did, and it just turns out that I'm good at that. Because the way my brain works. I'm good at it. I don't know exactly why, just the way I am. Um, I also, and maybe this has to do with a lot of different things, but I think a lot about human behavior, and I think a lot about user behavior. And, you know, most of the work that we do it has, it's for somebody else, it's not just for us. You know, we don't build, we build some things probably just for us, right? But most of the things that we do, particularly things that we get paid to do, we're probably building to help somebody else do something. And so it is helpful to be able to empathize with the way that people interact with things, and I find that both interesting, and I also find that, that ability to make those kind of quick connections with, oh, this is the, but you know, I remember when I saw this person kind of interact with this system this way, it did this, so, that maybe gives me some insight about what we should do, you know, because the way that we're constructing this maybe doesn't actually work for the user. And I've found that I think about that more than a lot of people. Doesn't mean there's not other people who are way better at it than I am, but I do pretty good at it. Those are a couple of things I do pretty good at. And I do it because of the way my brain works. It absolutely is because of the way my brain works. And then sometimes the way my brain works absolutely ruins me. Sometimes it just craters my day completely and it renders me unproductive. Particularly, with the, like, if my emotions come on strong, I can't work. I cannot work. I have to stop. There are many days, I mean, like, on a regular basis, where I end up crying. And, 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 and it, it, that's, you know, culturally, we don't like that. Culturally, we don't like a, that kind of expression of emotion. We tend to view it as sort of a sign of weakness and stuff like that. Um, and so we're embarrassed by it. But, uh, but that's common for me, and it's just it's a way that my emotions are getting out. Like, I usually feel better after I do that. I'm not exactly sure why. There's some, you know, some people think that there's like, well, it gets cortisol out of your system. The stre I, I don't know. That kind of sounds like BS to me. Like it comes out through your tears. I don't know if that really adds up. 
No, but some people say because there's, that you'll actually see higher concentrations of those things in your tears. They think that somehow it's leaving the body because of that. That may be the case. I don't know. It doesn't seem like the most effective system, but there are some people who think that. So anyway, I don't know because I'm not a doctor and I'm just kind of making this up as I go. But at the end of the day, the hardest thing about all this stuff is how alone I've felt for most of my life. And I felt alone because I felt like I was the only person who dealt, who, who, I, like, I felt like I had an experience unlike anyone else's that I knew. I felt like everybody else seemed like they were able to finish their homework and they were able to finish their, 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 all their college work and go through classes and take like five or six classes in a semester and they were able to balance all that stuff and they were able to, you know, keep focused at work and they were able to not have problems with, you know, with like say, I, man, I got to read all these slash dot comments. And I, I, it's like they are okay with that. And, they're all, and it's still to this day, like most people can read Hacker News and not get infuriated. I do. I get super pissed off when I read that stuff. I'm so, I, I physically am uncomfortable so that I won't read things like Hacker News and Reddit because... It just makes me so mad. And most of the content is just, mm, what's the big deal? But there are just some people who are kind of a little douchey on it. And sometimes that's kind of tolerated on there. And, and that infuriates me to such an extent that I cannot, I just can't even handle it. Right? But in all of those ways that I felt different, I felt utterly alone among crowds of thousands of people. Like at conferences and things like this. And I felt incapable of living the life that I'm in. I feel like I always screw it up and I always fail and everyone I love is going to grow tired of me and leave because they're just going to get sick of my crap. But the thing is, there's actually a lot of people who feel that way. A lot of people who, for one reason or another, whether the kinds of conditions that they have or things like that, they feel the same way. There's a lot of people who deal with this. And that's what we're really kind of trying to fight here. That's what we're working on. So if we talk about the worldwide community, so I'm talking about everybody, us, Human beings, right? Talk about the worldwide community. Take it up to this sort of macro level. So the World Health Organization did a study called the Global Burden of Disease. They finished collecting data in 2004 and actually released the report in 2008. It is the last report they've done like that. I don't know if they maybe do it once a decade or something like that. Anyway, you can go look it up. There's a big PDF that has tons of stuff about it, about all kinds of diseases in all kinds of locations all over the place. So it's this global burden of disease that tries to examine the, it, the impact of different diseases on populations all over the world. And what they found was that the burden of mental disorders is the largest of all disorder categories in North America. It's greater than cardiovascular disease and it's greater than cancer. So the burden, the impact that it has on the population, if we're talking about disease categories, we're talking about cancers, we're talking about cardiovascular diseases, we're talking about you know, metabolic stuff, we're talking about all sorts of different kinds of things. Mental disorders put the largest burden on the population. This is a quote from it. In all regions, neuropsychiatric conditions are the most important causes of disability, accounting for around one-third of years lost to disability among adults aged 15 years and older and over. So everywhere in the world, if you add that all up, neuropsychiatric conditions, mental disorders, are the most important cause of disability, account for a third of years lost to disability. One third just from that category of conditions. One third of years lost to disability is mental health issues. So if we look at them, let's look at the tech community. And that's the community I come out of. I've been doing this 20 years. That's like pretty much what I know, right? I'm a freaking nerd. Um, as far as we can find, there's basically no research. There's very, very little research done in the tech community around developer types, things like that. There's little things here and there. A lot of it's anecdotal. Um, there have been a couple small studies done in a couple places, but there's basically no research. So we tried to start doing it. And we have a thing called the Mental Health and Tech Survey and we do that every year. And in 2016, these are the results that we got back. Now, this information here is for just people in the U.S. And it's non-self-employed people because how the U.S. is different than many other countries that show up highly in the survey 
Most of them, it's the U.S. and then European countries and Australia, those are the, the, the biggest ones. And then um, you see a smattering of, like, of Asian countries and, and, and things like that. Um, so that's what we have in our survey. And remember, this survey is self-selective, which means that people choose to participate in this survey. They're not forced to, so it's not like we have a control group and we, then we have this group that we give a thing and see what happens. Like, we, this is self-selective, so there's something called a self-selection bias that we have to keep in mind with any kind, of con any kind of conclusions we draw from this. But I think there are some things we can get out of it that are pretty useful. So again, this was as of 11-16. There have been a, maybe there's a, a dozen, you know, things have been submitted since then. This is pretty much the larger category, and this is about 800, 900 respondents. So the first question that I want to talk to you about, and we're going to talk about four different questions. The first question is, do you think that discussing a health issue with your employer would have negative consequences? And we asked that about physical, and we asked that about mental conditions. So if we talk about physical, 72% of people said no, only 4% of people said yes, only 4% about a physical condition, talking to their employer about it. If we asked about mental health, it goes up to 23% for yes. That is five times more that think there would definitely be negative consequences if they discussed this issue with their, with their, with their employer. Five times many. Another question, would you bring up a health issue with a potential employer in an interview? We ask about physical, well, not many people are going to come bring up stuff because they don't want to do anything that might potentially endanger them, even though it is it, under ADA law, if they employ more than 15 people, it is illegal to discriminate against somebody based on that as long as you can give them uh, what they call reasonable accommodations, which is legalese for something, but it's vague. Uh, but in, again, reasonable accommodations, and then it's left up to the judges to figure that out. Okay, so physical conditions. 24% said yes, 36% said no, 40% said maybe. Probably depends on the condition, right? So then if we ask about mental health conditions, yes goes down to 7%, and no about doubles to 68%. Far, far fewer people say yes, twice as many people say no. Does your employer provide resources to learn about mental health issues and how to seek help? Remember how prevalent mental health issues are. Remember the impact that they have on society and the, the burden that, of, that they put on a society. And then keep in mind that in the U.S., the workplace is the primary conduit for health care. Most people get their ability to access health care through their workplace. And the workplace is responsible for, and, and expects to in many cases, handle healthcare questions, or at least point people to resources. So does your employer provide resources to learn more about mental health issues and how to seek help? Only 30% of people said yes. Only 30%. Rest is no or I don't know, which don't know is probably means is effectively a no. It might mean that they're trying, but they're not doing a very good job of talking about it and making sure that people understand. And then there's a final question that I want to share with you. Do you feel that being identified as a person with a mental health issue would hurt your career? I want you, do you mind if you raise your hands if you think that it would hurt your career? Most people. Most people in here think that. Well, in this case, 87% of people said yes or maybe. Only 12% said no, I don't think it would. Only 2% of people can say, no, it has not. And that's not like I asked 10 people. 800 people responded to this. That's a lot. Oh, and there's one more. Um, and I want you to remember that this is self-selective, so there's a self-selection bias to it. But I want you to also keep in mind that the general population generally runs, uh, most of the numbers you'll see is that about 20% of people at a given time in, say, North America or in the U.S., it depends on how you see it, uh, is dealing with a mental health condition. Uh, or they might say it's like within a given year, 20% of the population deals with a, a diagnosable mental health disorder. Okay? So 20%, which is pretty high. That is one in five people. And if you think about the people you know, the people you work with, that's a lot of them. And I bet they don't talk about it. Have you been diagnosed with a mental health condition was the question we asked. General population estimate, again, is about 20%. This is self-reported. 
But the report we got from that was 50%. Now, okay, so is it 50%? Probably. No, I don't think so. Is it maybe 30%? Is it higher than the general population? I think there's some probably. That's an assumption on my part. But that's a very high number. And that indicates perhaps that there are larger issues or more concerning issues within this group of individuals than there is just in the general population. And the fact of the matter is, ignore all that other stuff, ignore all this stuff, this is that sick workers don't work. They just don't. It doesn't matter what's wrong with them. If they have a cold, they don't work as well, or they don't work at all. If they're depressed, they don't work as well, or they don't work at all. The same outcome happens for an organization. They don't get the productivity that they hope for. So if we're talking about what's the upside for organizations, why try to do better in the workplace, why try to be supportive of mental health issues, it's because it benefits the organization and everybody else in it, and everyone in it. Everyone inside the organization benefits from this, from the top down. Because if you have mental wellness, you have better employees. Employees feel valued and they feel secure and they work more effectively when employers demonstrate a commitment to their well-being. And I think that makes sense to most people. If you think about the jobs that, I, if I think about the jobs that I have liked, that I really felt good about, it wasn't about what I was doing, it was about the people who I worked with and how I felt that they, the respect that I felt like they had for me. Did they have my best interests at heart? Or was I just a resource to them? So I'm going to work harder for somebody who doesn't treat me that way, who I feel like does have my best interests at heart and feels like they demonst uh, and, and demonstrates a commitment to my well-being. If they do that, I'm going to be more loyal to them. I'm going to work harder for them because I feel better about doing that work, no matter what it is. And people want to work for companies that respect them fully, that doesn't ignore their well-being, that doesn't push them too hard, that doesn't let them go when they get stressed out, that doesn't not know what to do and kind of abandons them. People want to work for companies that don't do that. And an inter a, a good quote, I thought, I had a discussion with my friend Greg Bogus, and he said, when we talk about 10 times, 10x developers, which I, you know, I heard this ridiculous term, which I'm, I, maybe there's a 10x developer somewhere in the world. When we talk about 10x developers, it's like it's a fairy tale. But you take a developer with crippling depression and you get them the right treatment and they will literally be 10 times more productive. So you want 10x developers? Try getting treatment to the people who actually work for you now. Also, it's a lot cheaper. But the problem is, is that change is hard, and it's hard because we're scared, and we don't know what to do, and that's challenging for us. We might be afraid of endangering the workplace. We have, we're you know, people, particularly people who are in leadership positions, have a responsibility to lots of people for the well-being and livelihoods of lots of people. And that is a part of that job. So that can be scary that you might be doing, if you do the wrong thing, you might endanger the workplace, the existence of the workplace, maybe. And you might be afraid, you probably are afraid, of losing your job if you feel like you reveal or you get treatment or somebody finds out or these kinds of things. And at OSMI, we can help, but there's three things I want to suggest that you could do right now or maybe when you get it done with this and stop, you know, don't just like leave and go do it, but please stay for the rest. Um, the first thing that you can do is you can get our OSMI handbooks. And we have handbooks for employers and employees. And they focus on, there's two. One is, uh, one is for, how, the, there's two that are focused on ADA law, the Americans with Disability Act, and how to apply that to mental health in a tech workplace. And there's one, there's one that's focused on employers, knowing your rights and, and your responsibilities, and then there's one for employees, where you know your rights and responsibilities. And then we have a third handbook about how to create supportive workplaces to promote mental wellness. We have these things available. They're Creative Commons licensed. You can go get them right now as eBooks on LeanPub. You don't have to pay anything if you don't want to. We like it when you give us money because it makes our 
we can actually do this work. But if you go in there, you go get the handbooks, you read the handbooks, you do the work, you're going to be much better informed about these kinds of issues and what you can do about them. The second is to speak openly about mental health. And that does not mean that you overshare the way that I do, necessarily. My, my, my therapist says I have a confessional personality, and I believe that is quite accurate. Um, but talking about the topic openly is hugely significant. Everybody here has a great amount of influence on the social groups and communities that you, you the circles that you walk in, that, that you belong to. You have more influence than you think you do. That's always been my experience, is that you have more influence than you think. You have to use that positively. And this is a way you can do that, by talking about this topic openly, by not being afraid to discuss the topic. To the extent that you feel comfortable that you can, I think it's important to do so. Because it, I have been constantly surprised at how it seems to free other people from the burden of fear that they have wrapped up around this stuff. And the third thing, and this is a, this is a tiny thing, and this is kind of a, I don't know, it's not metaphysical, but it's like, but I think this is deeply important. You have to tell people that they matter. You need to tell them that they impact your life positively. How strong and how great they are, and that you really, maybe you'd really admire them. Everybody needs to hear this. We all do. There are very few of us who go through life as a loner who can self-motivate completely. But particularly, people whose brains lie to them need other people to help them remember these things because they can't see it themselves because their brains actively tell them things that aren't true. My brain does all the time. So I want to bring this back around down to sort of like its essence and talk about, you know, we've talked about a few different, different communities and things like that. At the end of the day, communities that we have, like this Drupal community we have here, this really cool, impressive Drupal community that I'm seeing here, and all the different developer communities, the PHP community, WordPress community, um, just developers in general, JavaScript, uh, all, all these different communities that touch each other and work with each other and, and, and interact. Communities are about people. They're not about code. Code is sort of like the MacGuffin. It, it's this thing that sort of brings us together. But it could be anything. It could be beer. It could be this, that, whatever. You know, it could be you, you like brewers or it could be cigars or it could be fashion or it could be movies or things like that. But what matters about a community is the people. The story of a community is told in its people, not in, in, in this thing that brings the people together. What matters in a community is its people. And this is about our community. And that may, to you, that may mean X, Y, Z. It could mean a lot of things. But all of the things that we participate in, they are our communities, and we take ownership of all of that stuff, whether we choose to or not, whether we think about it that way or not. We are members of those communities. And we're talking about our colleagues, our friends, and our people. And sometimes they suffer in silence. I know I have, I still to this day suffer and don't tell people and I am in bad shape and I don't talk about it and I hide it. And I've done that since I've been 12 years old. Most of my life I've done that. And sometimes we lose people. Sometimes we lose people and we're left to wonder why and regret and try to understand and there's always going to be some people that we can save, and there's going to be some people we can't. But the only reason this happened is because of fear. The only reason we allow so many people to suffer in silence is fear. And the only reason we don't save more of our kin and our kith is fear. That's it. That's the only thing. So we have to choose. You and I and all of us, we choose We can choose to give in to fear. We can choose to hide. It's easy to hide and not say anything. It's easy to be silent. It's easy to be quiet and be okay with the status quo. It is easy to do that. It is really easy to do that. 
And I'll tell you something, having a mental illness, this is not something for the weak. This is not something that makes you weaker. This is the hard, amazingly hard. And the people who have to deal with these things have a great burden and they have great strength to continue through life with it. But the choices we make about these kinds of things, if we're going to make change in, these kind, in the cultures, the communities that we live in, this is not for those people who are weak or indifferent or content to be comfortable. It is hard to stand up to this. Just the way it's hard to stand up to bullying, just the way it's hard to stand up for uh, any kind of behavior that, that in a community sometimes we tolerate because we think it's too hard to say something about it. But I think we can do better. I think that we can meet inaction with action. And I think we can meet confusion with understanding. And I think we can meet indifference with compassion if we choose to be stronger than fear. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. But wait, there's more. Um, I haven't told anybody this uh, yet, but I think I'm going to make a great leap and uh, do something that I've been thinking about and wishing I could for a long time. And what I'm going to try to do is to do, you know, I started this thing, Open Sourcing Mental Illness, five years ago as, a, as just a, a talk that I did at PHP Tech. It was an unconference talk. Um, and it was really significant I got to do that, and that was about, well, that was four and a half years ago about. So, and a, a lot of things gradually have come along, and one of the things that I've tried, to, I've learned, is to take a few more chances. I'm kind of risk averse. That's the thing that's been tough for me. Uh, it's easy to do things when you know they're going to be successful. It's easy to do things when you know they're not going to be hard, and you know you're confident that you can do it. But I'm going to take a leap, and I haven't put this on the slide because I wasn't sure what I was going to say exactly. But I'm going to try to, right now, I work, I have a day job, I, that's what I do, I have a, my family has a comfortable, we have a very comfortable income, we do very well. We live in Indiana, it is super cheap. And so we do very well, because I work remotely, and so I make a better salary than I would at a local gig. And all this is getting around to it that I've decided that I'm going to do open sourcing mental illness as my full-time job. And, well, thank you, thank you, that's, I'm, I'm scared, I'm really, really scared, and I'm probably going to have to do consulting gigs and stuff like that to supplement, um, but, and it's scary because I know I'm going to have to, like, figure out how to get a certain amount of money uh, to just, like, not completely implode our life, um, but I think we can do this. And I think that it's something, I have found this to be the single most rewarding thing I've ever done in my life. And so I'm taking a leap and I'm going to do that. And I hope that you'll help me because I really need it. I need your help, uh, particularly identifying organizations who might be interested in helping with this financially. That is particularly useful to us. But every time you buy a t-shirt or a hoodie or you donate, something like that, any kind of amount of money, that makes a big difference. It allows me to keep doing this, to come speak at these conferences, to, you know, uh, to do the work. And right now we have way, way, way more work than time. And I think it's time then that I decide to do this full time. So that's who I am. I hope that you'll take a chance to look at our website, osmihelp.org. If you look at the donate section, we have a fundraiser going on right now. It would mean a lot to me if you took a look at it and you thought about it and thought if you, if you could either give a little bit, that's awesome, but if you just talk to other people about it too, and if there's places that you think can do something to help us out, to help us all out, that would be a lot. Because right now, it's going to be the case in a couple weeks that I'm not working for another company. I'm working for you guys. I'm working for you people. I'm working for you folks. 
I'm working for you because I want to make this better, because I want to change this culture, I want to change this community, I want to change this industry, and I want to save people's lives and have them not have to suffer like this. So I hope you'll help me out doing that. Thanks very much. Uh, we do have time for a few questions, uh, I think, uh, if you want to. There's about 10 minutes left in the session time. And if you do want to ask a question, you have to go to the microphone and ask. If you want to talk to me afterwards, that's fine. I will be around for a little bit, although I have to meet my sister for dinner at 6.30. So uh, if you have a question, just go up to the mic. If not, it's fine. I will wait here for a minute. You may do so or not. No pressure. It's all okay. It's all right. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Okay, well, thanks very much. Thanks for coming. I will see you guys soon if you want. Oh, there's flyers and stickers up here. The, the flyer's the same. It's two-sided. I'm sorry. Right, but you can take more than one. Feel free. I've got flyers and I've got stickers. If you want to take flyers or take stickers to give them to other people, that would be super awesome. And so more people can kind of find out what we're doing. So that would be great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I think there are things that are uniquely American problems that relate to that. I would probably say, though, that it seems to be the case, at least from numbers that I've seen, that this is a common thing in European-based industrialized cultures. So I don't think it's just an American thing. 
I think there are certain things that are unique to American culture that may contribute in to certain kinds of issues. Uh, but I would not say mental health in general is particularly problems with it is particularly in America. I, I guess my, my question or what I'm getting at is this is where American society mm -hmm. is trying to contribute to the problem. Yes.